the people of God. It's good to be with you and to open God's word together once again today. I want to look together at uh, John chapter 18, John chapter 18, beginning at verse 33 and reading through verse 38. Um, as Jesus enters into a discussion with Pilate about the nature of his kingdom. And so I thought that would be a good introduction for us to return to the topic of God. And so we read in John chapter 18, verse 33, these words, and let's pay careful attention to them, for they are God's own word. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. Then Pilate said to him, So you are a king. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? Thus far the reading of God's word, may he bless it to us. So what I wanted to do today was to kind of reorient ourselves where we began talking about the kingdom of God, and I thought maybe if I put it kind of in black and white on the screen before you, uh, that you would be, maybe be able to see more clearly what I sketched out uh, last time. One of the things that we see as we uh, come to the kingdom of God and think a little bit about the kingdom of God um, is that there are different ways of thinking about it. Um, and so one of the things that we had said before was, as we think about the kingdom of God, as we think about it, there are various ways to think of it. Um, when Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world, it does not mean that Jesus is not king over the whole world or that there is any part of the world that is not under his authority or not part of his kingdom. Uh, but he's talking about his kingdom in a different way. And that's what we wanted to do last time. We wanted to think about the kingdom of God and consider its two aspects together. Um, and so that's what I really left uh, for us here, the two aspects of the kingdom of God. Um, we can think of it in terms of its universal aspect, where Christ is king over all, and we can think of it in terms of its special aspect, uh, where we're thinking particularly about that kingdom that God has made for his people. Uh, they're just different aspects about talking um, about the kingdom of God together. So we can talk about the kingdom of God in different ways. And so we want to think about how we might talk about the kingdom of God, viewing them from these different aspects. Um, and so if we look at this at this way, that's a reminder again of what we hold on um, of what we saw uh, earlier. It's a universal kingdom, so we can talk about God's boundless great greatness, majesty, authority, and power over all that we read from Psalm 103. We can think of that acknowledgement of the kingdom that King Nebuchadnezzar made in Daniel chapter four. We read that last time as well. Um, but there is also a special kingdom, and that's what. Herman Vitzius says, that's when we're talking about what does it mean that my kingdom is not of this world? What does it mean that when Jesus says, my king, we should pray thy kingdom come? Um, what aspect are we praying then? Well, then we're praying about God's special kingdom. And that's what Herman Vitzius said in the 1680s. Besides this universal kingdom, or as it may be called, the kingdom of nature, God has constituted a special kingdom over his own people, uh, expressly elected for this purpose. And so we can see these are two aspects of God's kingdom. It's a universal kingdom and it's also a special kingdom. And then as we think more about that special kingdom, uh, we can make uh, further statements about those kingdoms. Um, and so one of the things that we want to continue to see is we're not talking about splitting them up or saying Jesus is king or not king. We're just saying there's different ways to talk about his kingship. When he says my kingdom is not of this world, he's not denying that universal aspect of the kingdom. He's not saying somehow that he is not the king um, of, the, of the whole world or that God's kingdom is not universal in that scope. He's talking about his special kingdom and that we can think about God's special kingdom in different ways. Uh, when we consider God's special kingdom, uh, we can divide it up into the way we talk about his kingdom uh, being a kingdom of this world and a kingdom in the world to come. 
um, and we differentiate between those two um, as God's people. Hopefully I'm not making you sick by switching screens and coming in and out, but I'm trying to figure out what would work best for us. Uh, so I'm clicking away with, at random. So hopefully this is not uh, making you sick by moving around. But we want to think about God's special kingdom. And it's a kingdom of grace in this world. And it will be a kingdom of glory in the world to come. Um, and so the kingdom even has different forms as we contemplate it now, as it's been inaugurated by the Son of God, but not yet consummated by his return in glory, making all things new. Um, we talk about it in this world mostly as a kingdom of grace. Um, still being built in this world. Um, but we know that one day when the Lord returns again in glory, it will be a kingdom of glory where everything will be uh, fulfilled and that will be a glorious day uh, in the kingdom of God. So we can even divide the special kingdom into different ways of thinking about it uh, in this world and in the world to come. Um, we can think of this kingdom being divided as it exists in this world into, into two economies. Uh, Vitzia said you can think about the Old Testament kingdom of grace um, as it was growing up in the Old Testament and the New Testament kingdom of grace. Um, and in the New Testament economy, as we consider the kingdom of grace, we can further divide that conversation and talk about its outward form, how that kingdom manifests itself in institutions and in various ways like that. And we can talk about how it manifests itself inwardly in the lives of God's people. Um, and so you see, we're not talking about different kingdoms. We're not trying to deny one aspect of the kingdom or another, but we're saying you can get more specific as you go along. Uh, kingdom of grace in this world, kingdom of glory in the world to come. And then as you think about the kingdom of grace in this world, uh, you can think about how you can divide it into the Old Testament kingdom, the New Testament kingdom. Uh, you can divide that New Testament idea into the outward forms in which it exists and the inward forms it takes in God's people. So there are lots of different ways to talk about the kingdom, and that's just what we want to make clear uh, as we go through this. There's different ways to talk. So I wanted to get into what do we mean when we talk about the different economies of the kingdom of grace, the Old Testament as opposed to the New Testament, and that's just what we want to think about here. Uh, the kingdom of grace in the Old Testament and the kingdom of grace in the New Testament. Uh, the Old, Testa ki Old Testament kingdom of grace it was a civil kingdom, uh, meaning there was a land. There was a particular place where you found uh, that kingdom. You found it in the land of Israel, ruled by a king. Uh, it was a civil kingdom. It was a ceremonial kingdom. Uh, there was a temp tabernacle or, or there was a temple. Um, there were priesthood. There were sacrifices. Oh, I need to get my face out of the way for this, don't I? Um, we want to continue to go down. So it's a ceremonial kingdom with a tabernacle and a temple with priesthood, with sacrifices, ceremonial laws. You could look at the ceremonial aspects of that kingdom. And it was also a spiritual kingdom. We don't want to pretend that the kingdom of grace in the Old Testament was not a spiritual kingdom. Uh, they had righteousness and peace being reconciled to God by the blood of the Messiah, which was to be shed when the fullness of time was come, uh, as Galatians 4.4 4 teaches us. But Galatians also teaches us that it was a spiritual kingdom, though in bondage under the elements of this world. Um, and so it was not yet the fullness uh, of the kingdom of grace revealed as it would be in the New Testament. Uh, because in the New Testament, the kingdom of grace is greater in every way. It's not a civil kingdom for a single nation anymore, but it's one for every tribe and tongue and people and nation to the very ends of the earth. Uh, and all these quotations are from Herman Vitzius. It says, he said, it has nothing human no rulers or elders who might seem to share with the heavenly king in the government of the church. There's only a king of the kingdom. He doesn't need any help in the management of his kingdom. So that civil aspect that was in Israel is now expanded to every tribe and tongue and people and nation ruled by the one king who is king over all. Um, and even though there were ceremonies in the old covenant kingdom of grace, there are not in the new covenant. It's not a ceremonial kingdom abounding in figurative representations, types and shadows, as the book of Hebrews calls it, but one in which there is nothing worldly, no worldly sanctuary or priesthood. Uh, there's only one chief high priest, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and this kingdom of grace in the New Testament is in every respect spiritual. It is in every respect the kingdom of God and the kingdom of the heavens. It is the kingdom of Christ. And so we can see these two different economies 
uh, working themselves out in the new Te- in the New Testament and the Old Testament, and seeing how the Old Testament shows us what the New Testament kingdom would be like, but shows us also that the New Testament kingdom is greater in every way um, because it's been brought to more fullness by the coming of the King, uh, who has Lord Jesus Christ, who has fulfilled uh, the types and shadows of the old economy and brought uh, new revelation to us uh, in these last days. And so we can see how the kingdom of grace is growing, how it is coming into the world, uh, how it differs in the New Testament from the old. And that was one of the things that we wanted to take note of uh, as we go along, these differences in, in how it comes in these various economies. And so one of the reasons we want, I wanted just to take the time to do a little bit of this is to say when someone talks about the kingdom of God, they can talk about it in a lot of different ways. Uh, they can talk about it in, in these terms uh, that we have already kind of gone through, uh, where we see these various ideas um, of the universal aspect, the special aspect, talking about the Old Testament, the New Testament. And so these things can change. These things can uh, very much take on new forms as we go along. And so it's very important to when someone says, what kind of kingdom are you talking about? Um, or how are we talking about the kingdom of God? That we make sure we understand our terms. Uh, because you can divide these things up in various ways. And so we talked about the two economies uh, this time, and so I want to get into more, uh, Lord willing, next time the uh, the differences between not the not the economies in the Old and New Testament, but in the in the outward and inward form that the kingdom of God takes in its outward institutions and its inward institutions. Uh, and then we also do want to think about what it means when the kingdom of grace will become the kingdom of glory uh, in the world to come. Uh, We look forward to that day. And so we want to think more about the kingdom and then think more about how that applies uh, to our lives. But hopefully this helps to show us a little bit how we've talked about the kingdom of God in different ways uh, in our theology. And it gives us hopefully a better understanding of it. Uh, So let's go to God and thank him for the clear teaching of his word on the kingdom of God. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, how thankful we are to know that that you are God over all, that there is no aspect of this world over which you are not king of glory. And we pray that you would also help us to understand that we talk also about the special kingdom you have made uh, over your people. And so as we talk about the kingdom of God and as we think about how it has, uh, how it has come in more and more fullness throughout the, the Old Testament and into the New, we thank you, Lord, for what our king has done by his coming the new kingdom that he has inaugurated over his people, uh, the great expansion of the kingdom. Um, And we pray that we would continue to think about that kingdom, uh, that spiritual kingdom that the Lord Jesus has brought in uh, by his coming and has inaugurated and that he will bring again in glory. And so as we wait for that kingdom of grace in this world to become the kingdom of glory in the world to come, Lord, we pray that you would give us patience, you would give us faithfulness to fulfill the roles you've given us in this world. You would watch over us and keep us, we pray, for we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Right, people of God, it's been good to spend this time with you. May the Lord bless you and keep you until we meet again.